What do you think about elderly lesbians and gay men? I've never come in contact with too many myself. But what I read about them is, uh, is uh, on the level. And uh, so it's very popular, seems to be. We might as well accept it as such. I don't approve of gay people at all. I think they better get into the church. And Pentecostal church seems to be doing the best at getting it out of their system. He leads his life, I lead my life. Have you ever had any sexual feelings for other men? No. Have you ever considered this yourself? No. I'm really, I'm really a, a woman, a <laughs> man. I have been a lesbian since the age of six, and it's been very, very difficult growing up. You know, the slurs in the streets. I never dreamt that we would have this kind of freedom. I never dreamt it would be so easy. <laughs> and it is easy. <laughs> If you had any advice to give to younger lesbians, what would you say? I really don't know what to say. It's just outside to be yourself. Who could ever have imagined that something like this would happen? How long have you two been together? 54 years. Been together 54 years. That's <laughs> now. Bruce and I have been together more than half a century. That in itself is very remarkable because we had to keep our lives very secret in that time. And the people that were closest to us had no real idea of what our lives were like or what we meant to each other. When we were young, we were frightened about the effect that our lifestyle would have on our parents. We also were concerned about the disapproval of our peers at that time, that there were many that were not ready or willing to accept a, life, a gay lifestyle. Well, I come from a middle-class, typical German-Jewish family, and they would say, what's the matter? A nice Jewish boy like you should have a nice Jewish girl. I said, of course I have nice Jewish girls, but um, I want you to know, because of the German penal paragraph 175, which was the penal paragraph about homosexuality, I want you to know, just in case something might happen to me, that you're not shocked and surprised. I can't lie, and so compared with many other people who are afraid and are in the closet, their lives are somewhat contorted, like you see yourself in one of those Coney Island fun mirrors. And I suppose, according to the lie, you either become elongated or you become more compact or smaller. Being silent is a kind of lying, you know, not telling about yourself. You feel like you want to tell somebody, and I thought, well, you know, I can't contain it. So I said, well, you know, I'll tell my kids, and if I keep their love wonderful, if I don't, it's just that chance I got to take because I'm tired of holding it. When my mother first came out to me, I really wasn't surprised at all. I knew she would eventually say it, and she did. I couldn't believe it. This, you know, this is grandma. This is the person that I watched television with and, you know, did things with and always, always admired. And, and you know, it didn't take anything away. It's just that I couldn't believe that my grandmother was a lesbian. What happened was we'd come over there for dinner, and, and she was expecting Sharon over. And Sharon came in, and my grandmother laid a very big kiss on Sharon. And that was like, oh my god, I couldn't believe it. You know, I had never seen my grandmother kiss another woman. You know, I never seen her kiss a guy, but you know, I never seen her kiss a woman. So that kind of shocked me. And then I started to say, well, 
come back to reality. This is the way she is. And I had respect for her before, but now it's just more. I remember writing out the word, I am a lesbian. I have to look at this. And then I remember looking through my notebook one day and thinking, oh, I shouldn't have this written down. Someone could read it. And I took some scissors and cut out that sentence and threw it in the wastepaper basket. And later in the day, I was walking across the room and I glanced down and there was the sentence staring up at me or at anyone who walked into the room much more clearly, unmistakably, than if I'd left it in the notebook. I remember thinking at the time, you know, that truth is the truth, and it doesn't hurt to try and cut it out. I came down here for my health because I began not to be able to take the northern winters. My body immediately told me this is the place for me to be. And about a year ago, Two other women who'd visited decided, happily for us, to move in next door. So we began to become a stationary community. And it's a place, what we hope is to be, not just what traditionally good neighbors have been, but a place where, in a very deep sense, you really share insights, share experience, share visions of how we hope to help to change this world into a less violent world. I know very well that I've been in an especially fortunate situation because when I was in my mid-40s, an aunt left me an income. This, of course, made it safe for me to do a lot of things that aren't that easy for other people to do. In the early 70s, when I came out publicly as a lesbian, I didn't have to risk perhaps losing a job, risk perhaps having trouble finding housing. All I had to risk was being despised. What I gained, of course, was to feel at last, after all these years, sane, because at last I publicly could name myself what I truly am. Barbara, do you ever regret having been a lesbian? You could say I'm a little battered from having lived the life of a lesbian, but um, I prefer to have been battered and to have been the person I really am. What you think of me, I don't know, but I'm here to put the record straight. You may think I'm just a sweet old lady here to spread goodwill, but you're all wrong. I'm a dirty old woman looking for a thrill. <laughs> I lived straight all my life, and I knew that I was gay. So I said, well, now this is a time in my life where I'm going back to my home. So I didn't know how to go about it. So I got a telephone, and I looked all through it, and uh, I couldn't find nothing but the bars. So I called them, and I kid them, you know. <laughs> Ask them if there's any old lesbians in there would like to talk to another old lesbian. <laughs> So they didn't think I was drunk or something. But some of them were real nice about it. And give me your telephone number, and if there's somebody comes in, I'll call you. And I was glad to do it. Nobody ever called. So I went through the directory again. I took it page by page. So finally, it said in there, um, counseling for lesbians. Oh, boy, I thought I'd hit the jackpot. <laughs> so I got on the phone and I called, got the answering service. <laughs> called again, got it again. So I thought, eh, I'll let it go. But once in a while I'd call just to hear that voice, because I knew it, wh whose voice it was. So anyway, about 
two weeks' time, phone begin to ring, and boy, it's been ringing ever since. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. I made my living all my life. And I've worked 40 years as a waitress. At five years old, I knew there was something I was different. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I liked women instead of men. Not that I, that I didn't love my brothers and men. I loved my uncles and my grandfather. My God, me and him who was thick, you know, I, I worshipped him. But I knew there was something wrong. But I thought it was me, you know, the nobody in the world was like that. So I grew up that way. And then when I met this woman, then I, I liked her and I, uh, I guess she liked me. She stayed with me for 58 years. Would any of you ever consider having a gay relationship or would that be out of the question? It would be out of the question. Out of the question. Me. Why is that? Uh, because I rejected that long ago in my childhood, if I felt such tendencies. I was always, uh, I had other uh, influences that kept me away from it. Why, why did you, why would you reject it if you don't think there's anything wrong with it? It didn't seem healthy to me for my personal life. Where do you think most elderly gay people live in the United States? Well, I would say California, maybe, or... I imagine they're scattered through the rest of the population. They aren't always identified. The story about me being a gypsy, it's in the blood. I just feel at home on a horse. I feel like a gypsy baron because I'm in the country and it's people and it's outdoors. I have my animals. And then when I go riding, I take both the dogs, and I have to take the goat. What else would I do with him? So uh, I have a nice family. And I do try to get a ride in every day, one horse or the other. After I was 30, I was in and out of a monastery. I was in a religious life till I was 60. And then I decided to, to leave. Well, I really didn't come out till I was 72 because I had lived in, uh, you know, in, in the community. And then after I uh, was working for this gentleman, I, I wasn't really exposed to gay life. I was into horses and, and everything that went along with being a, an ordinary um, citizen until after I came to Tucson. And then uh, I met people that were gay. You can love God just as much being gay as you can being straight. And I talked to various priests about it. They really didn't condemn it. Like I say, the modern priests are either you could, whether you want to say broad-minded or whatever, but they just don't put you down. You thank God every day for what you got. And I have plenty to be thankful for. I joined Dignity. It's a Catholic gay group. My neighbors are all very wonderful. What more can you ask? I certainly never act like an 84-year-old man. Every day I do yoga in the morning. If I didn't do it, I wouldn't be able to do what I do if I saddle a horse and all that. So I'm very thankful that I am what I am and who I am. Well, I came to realize that I was a lesbian very early on, and that bothered me a lot because I was still uh, plugged into, you know, what society thinks about that, what the world thinks about it. I went to several psychiatrists trying to resolve it or solve it or whatever, and one that I went to said, well, you know, uh, is that really so bad, you know? Uh, and that set me thinking. I got to thinking, too, well, maybe it isn't so bad. And that's when I just turned around and faced it and finally got to be comfortable with it. 
rather than feeling tormented about it. When I finally named myself as a lesbian, said the words to myself, I felt whole. I live in a high-rise for older and handicapped people. I guess they conceive me as being different. I suppose it's true because they're into more conventional things, you know, like uh, going to church and coming home and that sort of thing. I imagine if most people in this building knew I was gay, they would go up in flames uh, because uh, older people tend to be a lot less tolerant about that. And of course, the older, the less tolerant. Um, they have, you know, a lot of preconceived ideas about what gay people look like and so forth. And I've been told, well, I look feminine. I had one person remark, oh, I don't believe it. You look so feminine, you know. Uh, so people have some really wild ideas about what gay people are all about. In my relationships with men, I always felt something was missing. I knew it would be nice to be with a woman, but I didn't expect the thunder and lightning and comets that happened. <laughs> <laughs> We hadn't seen each other for about 20 years. Her marriage was falling apart. My life with Mary Meggs was falling apart. At a certain point, when we met again, it just became, in a certain sense, you can say it, it became the love it had always been without our quite naming it that. But when it really, I know when the feelings really rose up in me, it wasn't like something new, but like, like the feeling I'd had when I'd first seen this amazing person walking across the Bennington campus. <laughs> I was a freshman and she was a senior. We were very aware of each other, although we didn't we express it in any way. We yes. hardly spoke two words to each other, yeah. but we'd sort of... I remember she was looking into your eyes. I just recognized how unusual she was. And she was very beautiful, striking, very proud, dashing, the brave. I thought, oh, wow. Somebody so wonderful and uh, can be a lesbian that's got to be all right. When the young women danced to the phonograph, it was always a delightful time. And I'd sit around and watch for Barbara. And she would come dancing by and her eyes would hold. It was as if I didn't want her to know how important this watch was. When, well, because it, you know, it was love, you know. It was a very scary thing. And supposing, uh, you know, I tell you, it's puzzled me a little all my life. And it puzzles me about other people why it's so scary to have other people know that you're in love with them. Because they might not be in love with you. I guess that's the, that's the terrible thing that you don't want to, to learn. The whole relationship is still a miracle to me, the friendship of Shelley for me. In a way, it's given me a new life. You know, I have cancer. It's very difficult to cope with such situation. For me, it is a new love affair without the sex in it. Just about a year that we'd known each other, I was on my way home from the gay synagogue. This man said, where are you going? Can I give you a lift? And then a few days later, you called me up and you said, why don't you come next Friday over to the house and have dinner with us before we go to, then we go to shul together. Shelley's lovers seem to be fond of me too, and I feel that they're both all my sons, that I have two sons in a way. But it's not that we see each other three or four nights a week or something as regularly as that. We talk on the phone most every day. If I have to go to the hospital for an important consultation, I won't go without him. I'm lucky that he's self-employed and can arrange his time, and he does arrange the time to my needs. A lot of people think it's hell because you're not married, because you don't have a family to look after you. I don't think there's that much difference, except that I feel more free than straight men do, because 
They can't do everything they want to because they have to do what their wife wants them to do. And uh, I don't have those obligations. Unless I found the rarest of all men, he would want me to be his wife first and the mother of his children next. And a writer, if I could fit that in. Any time I had been sexual with another woman, the result of that experience had always been a feeling that we knew each other now much more truly as the people we were. And my experience with this nice man was that the experience resulted in our being more and more strangers to each other. I liked him until it come to where we'd be alone and he'd want to put his arm around me and I'd think, oh, if I, you know, if I could just love him and could do that, I couldn't. I could cut up with him and have a big time, but that's as far as it could go. Oh, and what I'd a gift to care for him. How come? I, I, then I, I didn't know that had been all right. Everything had been, I'd have pleased my folks and his folks, everybody had been pleased. But I couldn't do that. If you hear me calling, it's only my heart. Please be still, oh my heart, please be still. Oh my eyes are cloudy. Bruce was a dancer and I was his accompanist. I was terribly attracted to Bruce when I first saw him. And after all, he was a very, very handsome guy. Ah, uh, you certainly can't say that about me. <coughs> I can say it about you, but you can't do oh, the reverse. Oh, no, that uh, there was really nobody that I had ever seen before that compared to you. Well, maybe you hadn't seen too many people. <laughs> when I first met Jean, I was engaged to a young lady that I had known for five years or more. And I wasn't quite certain that uh, Jean was going to be the one that I was going to turn to. But uh, as time went by and I began to learn more of Jean, I began to feel something much stronger. And uh, ultimately, I had to make a decision whether it was to be the girl or Jean. And I chose Jean. After 54 years, we're still in love. Lots of people live under the same roof for that length of time, but they're not necessarily in love, and that sets us apart. In many instances in gay relationships, a role is, is adopted by one of the parties. That is, one of them will be the masculine one and one would be the feminine one. And I find that in our case that there has never been that sort of feeling at, at all about acting out a, a, a role. We have considered ourselves in all cases men. The limitations uh, that n naturally come with age perhaps uh, do uh, alter some of the frequency of the expression of, uh, of love. But uh, there, it's, it has not in any way diminished the depth of our feeling for each other. And I can say quite honestly that this guy still turns me on. <laughs> he must turn on very easily. <laughs> Years ago, if you went to confession and told a priest you had an affair with another guy, well, they'd almost throw you out of the box. We were taught that those things were sinful. Then you wouldn't go back to confession anymore. Move it, kid. What are you 
think about being gay, Paul? Well, I really don't think of myself as gay, per se. I just who I am. I was always me, and uh, I just seem to uh, like men. Not that I don't like women. I have a lot of lady friends. But I prefer being with men. Everybody's bisexual, and then you gradually either go one way or the other. You can't define it. I don't think anybody can, why people are gay and why they remain gay. All I can say is if you go that way and not fight it, then you'll be happy. And if you fight it, you're going to fight it all your life. What do you think of homosexuality for people over 65? I don't frown on it. I think we have to live with the times in as much as there are a much larger percentage of women than men. What are women to do? Homosexuals in general, they only have one thing in mind, and that's sex. But when they get to a certain age, they're all washed up. And that's the end. Growing old here and watching the world grow old around me, I really don't see much difference in the aging of gay people and the problems of growing old. Seems to me we all have the same financial problems. We have the same problems of whether we are lonesome or not, which is really a frame of mind. Sorry about that, David. It is nice to start a day with friends, old and young. In the gay community, there are many young people who are not comfortable in their own home because their parents and relatives will not accept them. They look for me as an older relative, a father or grandfather, and they look for my house as a home that they can go to after being rejected in their own home. Good eggs today, Frank. There came a day when the doctor called and told me my lover, 41 years, had to be in the hospital. He was incompetent. And reluctantly, we did admit him to nursing care. And he had a serious attack and passed away. That left me with a great void. Well, you have things to do and you feel like they're precious. And they're taken away. You feel like you have nothing to do. And you have really no purpose. I used to say that every day of my life he made me laugh. That was true. We had more or less thought that we would go down to a time with adjoining rocking chairs recalling happier days. But when Bill was declared incompetent, it became quite a problem and that the laws of our land have no place for the unity of two people of the same sex. The doctor told me that she might even die on her way home. And I told her all that. She said, I want to go anywhere, anyway, because that's what I want to do. And she lived eight weeks. And Dr. Fink said, I don't know what's keeping her alive. I know what's keeping her alive, because she's where she wanted to be, and we was together, and we could talk. She made up her mind. She was looking after me. She knew she was going to leave me, and she wanted to prepare me what to do and tell me. Yeah, that's what the reason she did. It's so damn difficult to entertain these young people today. They don't smoke. The reefers grass I don't have. They don't drink alcohol, hard liquor. This one wants that and sip a drink and so on. And um, it's um, and when it comes to food, forget it. This one doesn't eat red meat, this one only wants white meat, and the other one doesn't want anything being killed. No more fun, this 
stress has gone out of having people over. You may have to go into the hospital this week, right? Yep. Can you tell us about that? Well, I don't know. I'm scheduled to take another t to take a test for spinal and myelogram that I want to do, and I just don't know anymore. But I want to go in for one test, and one may never come out for all I know. Marty, you told us earlier about um, your your lover, your second lover. Well, one of my lovers went in in January for to have X-rays taken, and he never came out. And, Died in March. My last lover. He, they discovered lung cancer. And they lost the end of it. And um, yeah, so but I expect to come out and see you all again at a happy occasion. <laughs> Maybe the damn film will get finished at some time. That you don't show posthumously for me, <laughs> for my life, for my turn. Sage has been most helpful to me. Sage's senior action in the gay environment. They uh, support the elderly, gay, and lesbians. We estimate that there are 3,500,000 lesbians and gay men over the age of 60 throughout the United States. Over the past seven years, there are a number of organizations all over the country that have started up that are focused on the needs of elderly lesbians and gay men. When we started SAGE five years ago, we had a vision of providing social services. We thought we could provide telephone reassurance, escort services, friendly visiting, shopping, but we really never did think that we would be able to get 250, 350 people for a social where we'd all be together intergenerationally, dancing together, sharing together, with a real sense of camaraderie, sisterhood, and brotherhood. For most younger, lesbians and gay men. I think there's a stereotype of what it means to grow old. And it's a stereotype that, of course, affects how they perceive older gay people. And it also affects how they think of themselves as they age, as we age. And that stereotype is, has something to do with being very alone, uh, being bitter, being uh, sexually compulsive, really lusting after uh, younger people who you can't possibly get. Uh, there, there's a, a suicidal aspect to the stereotype. There's a, a lot of feelings that are just very negative and that are, of course, a result of having internalized what the larger society thinks about gay people and about older people. Where I was engaged at work, I was really trying to keep myself as, 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 as straight as possible to avoid any kind of uh, of flamboyant dress or uh, flamboyant actions, that is to say, anything that might be termed uh, effeminate by, uh, by other, other people who were observing me. So who will show us some flamboyant behavior? You know who. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do it? No. Uh, I, I wouldn't be good at know. it. I don't really know. A hand on the hip was more or less de rigueur, and the, the limp wrist was also part of it. And then, of course, a certain swaying in here as one walked. This made the, the perfect uh, combination of, of movements to indicate what, what society considered all gay people to be. And what would a conservative or masculine well, more or less, uh, certainly uh, to avoid a hand on the hip and to also keep control of the wrist. Never, never do that. If necessary, a clenched fist would probably be better. But no, just an even, ordinary stride, that's all. The people who tell us don't flaunt it, be what you are if you have to be, but don't flaunt it, can have no idea of of the effect that has on our inner beings. Come Sunday, I went to church on Sunday, and a lady came in with a little girl and sat next to me. And the little girl looked over, and then she looked over at her mother, and she said, the man's wearing an earring. 
And the mother's sister told her to be quiet, and she kept saying, the man's gotten there. So that made me sit up, and I thought, well, okay, can you take a good look? I felt like I was in a foreign country. I was putting on all the time. And I'd walk down the street, and here'd come a woman. She'd look what they call butchy now. And that, and I'd think to myself, wonder if she's like me, you know? And oh, if, but I didn't know how to approach her or what to say. And I would get my head knocked off, say a thing like that then. So I left it go. I really had to rethink my feeling about flamboyant people. And they, they are known uh, generally as uh, drag queens. And I found that that their stand uh, during the Stonewall revolt was something that was most unusual and most admirable. Well, it was actually the Stonewall uprising that made me feel that it was important for all gay people to come together then. Their stand was something that could give John Wayne lessons in what true grit really means. I wasn't really an activist, politically, organization-type activist. But after the kids had the courage and picked up the bricks and bottles and threw them at the police, then I felt I wanted to be on the barricades, too, and became active. And the candle of being an activist was lit. And I'm very grateful for it because it helped me since then to become actively fight my illness, and I hope I'll be able to be around to fight for a longer time, and I will fight for any minority, for any discrimination towards any minority, whether it be black, Jewish, elderly, or, 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 or gay, lesbian. I will always fight, as long as I live. I hope I have the spirit of fight. I think the legacy I'd like to leave as a black lesbian mother is to have my children have loving relationships, to learn to respect each other, learn to respect women as human beings. And I feel that we have a double struggle, that is to say, gay men and lesbians of color, to change what society thinks we should or shouldn't be. Meeting so many people who are older, much older than I am, often by decades, whose lives are, despite the oppression, whose lives are rich and full and active and hopeful, it certainly gives me hope about what my life will be like as I grow older. One thing that makes me so happy about the present moment of history is that when I look at the faces of young lesbians now, it's a, a look of freedom to be who she chooses herself to be, and a look of relief that she doesn't have to follow the pattern society tells her. She has to, a look of being her own, her own woman, and that delights my soul. What I'd give to be about 50 years younger. I know that it's changing. You know, people have begun to think different. They're far and few between, and then them few tries to educate the others. I'm not asking anything from straight people. Only just to accept me what I am. I just want to live my life and be free like they are. That's all. Oh, tell me, sweet Jesus, I'd really like to know. Will there be gay people in heaven? And if there's not, who in the hell wants to go? If you hear me calling, it's only my heart. Please be still, oh my heart, please be still. Though my eyes are cloudy, it's only my heart. Please don't cry, oh my heart, please don't cry. Loving you dearly, I'll always be there. 
waiting for some way to show I still care. If memories haunt you, it's only my heart. Yes, it's only my heart that you hear. And why am I saying it's only my heart when it's all I can give just my heart? Loving you dearly, I'll always be there, waiting for some way to show I still care. If memories haunt you, it's only my heart. Yes, it's only my heart that you hear. And why am I saying it's only my heart when it's all I can give just my heart?